we saw this happen with music too, JB, when we were growing up with artists like MC Hammer, he realized, okay, I'm going to do the same thing I did for the first album for the second album. And it, and it just, after a while, like people are like, no, we want something different. And I honestly believe this is why someone like Madonna was always able to succeed. She was always a step ahead of what was currently pop popular. So every Madonna album was different. Like one album, she may have like the like a uh, virgin like image with the long necklace and the net, you know, uh, arm lace stuff, like whatever that stuff was that she was wearing. Yeah. Then the next album, she switches to something completely different. That's how people like her were able to have like a long career. Same thing with someone like Michael Jackson. But if you keep doing the same thing over and over, eventually people will get bored and they'll check out. You got to give people something different. And I do feel like that, like. Like even like I said, like I, I love going to the movies, but I used to do it more often. And now I don't because I'm just like, number one, it's more expensive now. So if yeah. I'm going to spend my money at the movie theater, the movie better be good. Damn it. Yeah. Sabs, <laughs> <laughs> <Yo. laughs> let me let me ask you, did you know that this was all predicted 20 years ago? I did not. Let me show you. All right, let's go here. So this was 20 years ago. This says, Koplovitz, consolidation kills creativity. This was written in September 15, 2003. It says, USA Network founder Kay Koplovitz suggested Monday that media consolidation may end up stifling creativity in the television industry. Quote, consolidation in and of itself isn't necessarily bad, end quote, Klopovitz, now a principal of Klopovitz and Company, said during a luncheon panel here conducted by the Radio and Television Research Council. But they said, but from a creative point of view, I get concerned. Klopovitz said that the real danger is that it will be harder for the bright idea to surface with consolidated companies that have a lot of other balancing factors that they're trying to weigh, like paying greater attention to the bottom line or trying to create more efficiencies in the merged entity. Quote, you really need to have new ideas on the plate, end quote. Klopovitz added that it also becomes harder for fresh producers and other talent to get access to the consolidated media companies. It is tough to get brand new people on the playing field. USA is one of the cable assets Vivendi Universal is selling to General Electric companies, NBCs, in a deal that represents the most recent example of merger mania in the media. The RTRC panel called, now let me tell you what I really think, consisted of executives who had left corporate jobs like Klopovitz, like Koplovitz, I'm sorry, Barry Cook, Chief Executive Officer at Nielsen Research Media, David Bender, former president of Media Mark Inc. Incorporate. A fourth panelist, Bruce, uh, Bruce Goldrich, uh, president of Insights, Accountability, and Eyeballs Incorporated, managed the media consolidation at, that ha had hurt consumers. He argued that when networks like ABC keep distribution and produ production in-house, it results in TV shows that don't really appeal to viewers. So media mergers may help the bottom line, but end up weakening your products. As a result, backlash of disaggregation may start. Yeah, this is a very good, I, I mean, they made this prediction. I, I think they're correct. You know, it's not always about what's what's well, it is for them about profit. But in my mind, it's not always about what's profitable. It's about like, is the quality there? Like and, and that's something that I do look towards. Like, don't just and, and don't just make a sequel for the sake of making a sequel. You know, like don't just be like, well, the first one did well. So let's make a second one. And then the script is is not good, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is another example um, from Gamer. Cobra Kai is a really good show on Netflix. And I'll tell you something about Cobra Kai for those who don't know. That show was presented to every major uh, channel, every major network in broadcast television. They all turned it down. They all turned it down. 
So it became like a, they did like a little web series. And then Netflix was like, you know what? We'll pick it up. They tried Netflix. And it, that show was freaking amazing. And it does very well on Netflix, obviously. But again, that goes back to taking risk. And I think that's another example where I don't think ABC, even the CW, like none of those networks wanted to take that risk with the show like Cobra Kai. And I think that was a missed opportunity. Yep. And if, you know, these media companies were more worker owned, I'm just saying. Uh, what he says, it originated on YouTube when YouTube was making originals. Oh, yep. Yeah, because see, all the networks turned it down. They didn't think that it would do well. But they believed like another 90210 would do well. Like we don't need another 90210. We don't need another Dallas. We don't need another Dynasty. These shows have already existed and they did really well back then. You can always just show reruns of that. But stop recreating these shows that were really good in the 80s and the 90s because when they redo it, it's just not done as well. It's not as good. Yeah. And, you know, the, you know, the artistic expression, because that's what it really is. We're talking about art. It's not truly being expressed because when capital gets in the way and gets in, in, into the system, it stifles that creativity. So then we're just being fed the same slop every single time. Uh, Casey says reality TV killed writing as well. I'm going to tell you something about that because that was actually part of the the final uh, paragraph actually in this article. It says during the panel, Koplovitz also says she was surprised at the legs, the longevity of pop popular that reality TV programming was enjoying. She said the program essentially has become like sporting events for younger viewers. So what ha happened back then was during the last writer strike early in the 2000s. Instead of actually just paying the writers and allowing them to be able to write again for original scripted content, they went the reality TV route. And so this is when reality TV had a boom because it didn't require writers or it required very little writing. So that's why we got the reality TV boom back then. And then we started to see all these real housewives. Donald Trump, you know, became more a household name, all these different things, because guess what? If it weren't for that, then we wouldn't have had a President Trump probably because everybody would be like, Donald who? That's a good point. That is a good point. Because the thing is, is like the first reality TV show I remember watching was The Real World. And it was on Next. MTV. And I, I think they kind of like, you know, showed how at least the first season, they showed how raw and gritty it could be of just just showing seven people living in a house that don't know each other and are very different. Now, later on the real world, they started to, to make it a little bougie. Like, I'm just going to keep it real where all the people in the house were college students or college graduates. Like they, they started to make it more homogenous, which I did not like. I liked it when it was more gritty. I liked the first season, which was New York where you had some, you had Eric, someone who was a dancer, you had someone who was a, a rapper, you had a writer, you had, you know, one person I think in that house was like a college student. I liked, uh, the, the second season was I think San Francisco or no Los Angeles was the second season, right? All those people were different. Again, everybody in the house wasn't like a college student, a college degree. And the third season, which was probably one of the most powerful ones, which featured Pedro, and for some people in this country, that was their first introduction to the HIV AIDS like community and an issue that we had in this country, seeing that through the eyes of someone who was living it, which Pedro was living that. Right. So they, that would that dealt with some real serious stuff. And then somewhere along the way, they decided, let's only put people on this show that are college educated, that are very attractive. And let's just run with that. And that's that's when the real world changed. I thought it was better when it was more gritty and it was more raw, right? Yep. But but yeah, I mean, reality TV did change a lot of things. But some of those shows that are reality were still somewhat scripted, like the show Laguna Beach and the show The Hill. I don't know if a lot of people realize this, but even the actors admitted later on, excuse me, the the whatever I'm called, the actors admitted later on 
that even the hill was scripted. Mm -hmm. And think about this, guys. If you're having lunch with your friend, how is it you guys are sitting and having lunch and nobody like misspeaks? No one like interrupts each other. There's no, no one comes by and waves or anything like that. Like every conversation is perfect. Come on now. Yeah. Yeah. And technically uh, I would say one of the first reality TV shows was actually cops. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Cops. Cause Bad everybody, Bad everybody Bad watched it. You know, we can all, we all sing the theme song, but yeah. Uh, when so we got, for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 